better song celebrating each other on this great day, International Women's Day. So I'm going to hand over to Caroline. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's great to see such a variety of women. It's uh, especially the young women. Uh, my name is Caroline Fleming, and I've actually worked with Dee on the Equality Women's Manager also, and also with Marion. Um, they've just asked me just to put together a small presentation. So what I've done is I've just picked two women, one from Cork and the other is from uh, Tara or to Kerry. Two very, very different women, but I just wanted to share with you some, um, their achievements and what they've done, because I was quite impressed myself. Um, this woman is Jennifer Lussa. She was actually born at Bridge of Wren. Uh, she was born in Tarmouth, which is actually just outside Talbert in County Kerry, in 1917. Uh, she then moved to Oxford to become a nurse. And in 1939, while studying in Oxford, actually, yes, she met him at a ball. Uh, she met Quasi Musa. He was a prominent Falak, um, politician and nationalist, and a tribal leader. Uh, Quasi, he was the eldest son of the Prime Minister of Kat. Kalat, which is basically in Pakistan, which is a very, very different place than Tarabar to appreciate. In, <laughs> in 1948, just a few months after Pakistan earned its independence from Britain, they moved into a town called Pishan. Uh, here, this was an ancient tribal culture that believed pretty strongly in the Purda, that is where uh, as religious belief that women uh, should not be seen by their men in public. And then their entire system was turned upside down by the arrival of this hot-tempered County Kerry woman. In 1956, uh, unfortunately, a tragedy stuck, and her husband got uh, killed in a car accident. Um, but she decided to stay on because she wanted her son to actually live with her extended family. And she'd actually just become very, she, she considered that to be her home. So her independence of mind often attributed to her Irishness, and she often was made, made references to the Irish Republicanism, which led her into politics. She joined the National Freedom Party of Pathad, and in 1970, she was actually the first woman to win a seat in, in that parliament. As you can imagine now, she, she refused to wear the burqa. She was a white woman from Ireland, and was in the middle of all these, well, beardy men, but she stood her ground. Yeah, she, she basically said they had met a woman from Ireland before, so she definitely stood her ground. Um, after several years, she founded the first Women's Association and Family Planning Clinic. And more famously, she actually stood up to the, the Prime Minister at the time, who was uh, Ali Bhutto, who um, always wanted her to, he was always thought he'd wait, basically win her over to get her a vote. But no, she was having none of it. Um, so she, she really stood up for the independent rights, not just of the women in, in her region, but also just of the whole population. Uh, during the Balak uh, re revolt in the late 1970s, when local freedom fighters were battling the Pakistani government, she worked on both sides to restore peace. So she was really just a peacemaker, and she just wanted to stand up for the rights of, of, that, of, the, of what she considered now to be her country. Uh, Jennifer remained in Balakistan, sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong, uh, for 60 years, refusing to leave even when the neighbouring Afghan province was being taken over by the Taliban. Um, her son became a diplomat. Uh, he served in both the USA and in Russia. In the 1980s, when the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, she not only took in refugees during that destruction, but she also used her own money to, to make a nice factory so that they could produce cold water for the refugees and have reliable refrigeration for a region that wouldn't have much electricity. She also um, took on board the plight of the young girls in that region, and so she took up social work, because obviously she wasn't busy enough. Uh, there she founded the Girl Guides and the Women's Association. And basically she's quoted as saying that she found that for the, the education of the women. And she, this is just a quote, and I think it just puts it into context that she was a very ordinary woman. She wasn't looking for any um, medals or gold medals or what have you. So she just, as you can see there, she just says, even now as I sit here in Pishin, I feel I'm home. They don't put me on a pedestal because that would be terrible. Jennifer actually died on the 12th of January in 2008. Uh, her funeral procession was attended by thousands of burly, turbaned patterns, 
many of them are allied to the Taliban, who raised cheers of Mummy Jennifer in her honour as the cortege passed through Kishun. Just to give you an idea of the situation there, this is the territory on the left, and that's also the, the woman in Burka, which she refused to refused to wear. Um, and just there, she said she joined thinking she joined politics, thinking that she could do something for the Bolshevik and something for women. But you can't liberate women until you liberate men. They expected a woman in a burqa, so when I arrived, they were a bit surprised. <laughs> <laughs> so I think she's a, quite an amazing woman. And um, what actually struck me is that not many people have actually heard of her. Um, and I mean, she was like, I mean, if that was, um, you know, if that was perhaps an Irish man, would we not have heard that he was the first man in Pakistan? Can you think about it, you know, in, in the government? So I just think it's just a little bit of food for thought. The second woman that I'm just going to briefly talk about is a very different woman. Her name is Margaret McCurtain. Some of you might be actually familiar with her because she has actually done a lot of talks in around Kerry. Um, she's actually a, 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 a nun. Um, she was born in 1929, County Cork. Oh, yeah, her connection with this still, because I thought, yeah, I had to have a connection with this still. <laughs> At the age of nine, she was a patient in the old Union Hospital, which she referred to as a creepy place during a diphtheria uh, breakout the epidemic. At 21, she entered religious life. Uh, she already had her primary degree in education um, and a diploma in teaching, but she joined the Dominicans. Her family couldn't believe for someone who would be such a student uh, activist in UCC during her studies, how she could actually enter a convent. But she's, she's actually quoted as saying that uh, Irish women in the 1940s and 50s, their choices were limited, and becoming a nun had the advantage that she wouldn't have to abandon her job by the marriage bar. So that's an interesting way of, yeah, <laughs> very interesting. So some of, the, some of her achievements, uh, she has many, many, and, she, and she, she's still ongoing. Uh, she campaigned for years for the, abolish, uh, the abolition of uh, corporal punishment. Uh, she's an advocate for now activists for children with special needs. Uh, she publicly speaks out against domestic violence uh, on, and on behalf of birth control, when these issues are often ridiculed by the church. In 1995, she became a patron for the Right to Remarry campaign, when civil uh, divorce, divorce was against the Irish Constitution. She also founded the first community college in a disadvantaged um, part of Ireland, which is in Ballyfermot, which is still going strong today and is actually a very popular college. Uh, she was also an outspoken fighter for over 25 years against apartheid, and she, in the 1980s she was a delegate uh, in the World Peace Conferences. Um, prior to entering Conway, she had graduated from UCC, uh, and got first honours degree in history and English. She was awarded the Peel Memorial Award, the gold medal for the most outstanding student, and then she completed her higher diploma in um, education. Uh, she, just, she went on then to do her postgrad in 